Dr. Haas from Quality Austria. He will be the moderator of this discussion now. We had already our break, so we will immediately continue with our session and we will start with the discussion and please take over. Thank you very much, Professor Kress. Um, good afternoon. To my person, very briefly, I'm a GP in Vienna and I'm working in the field of quality in healthcare systems and in medicine for many years now. And may I just have some opening remarks for this discussion now. Um, it's my pleasure and my honor to moderate this discussion. It will be interesting, I'm pretty sure. And I may reiterate what Professor Trady has said. I think this is a very unique opportunity for this group to produce something that can change at least some measurements in pain treatment in different countries, if not in the whole of Europe. We can send a message to the EU level and back to all the different, different countries within the EU. The goal of this meeting, and I think you all are aware of this, um, I mean your, your signature, your formal signature is not as important as it, it may seem. You will be asked to sign the final document at the end of the meeting. But I think the most important is that the spirit of this group and the, and the details we can work out for quality indicators in pain treatment can be forwarded to the institutions they have to come to. Every document can be improved, every document could be better, that's clear, and uh, nobody expects something that's perfect. But I think it is important that quality indicators are on the table, are on the agenda, and you heard from Mrs. Klasnik, there is a chance, there is an opportunity that the outcome of this meeting will be taken uh, to the institutions within the EU as well. For methodology, based on the draft, I think you all have received the latest version of the draft. Um, this draft is only a basis, as the speakers have already mentioned. Uh, it's not written in stone. All the indicators that are suggested in the draft are validated. They come out from the uh, Spanish project Professor Saturno has uh, introduced to you. But keep in mind that this paper you all have should also be self-explaining to non-experts. It is a paper which can be forwarded to politicians. It is a paper which can be forwarded to non-physician, to non-scientists. Therefore, there are these introducing chapters two to four in this paper. And uh, I would then like to start putting these chapters, two to four, out of discussion if you agree. But this is the first part we will have to discuss together. We have three areas of discussion for the uh, indicators, which is structure, process, and outcome. You all have microphones. Please use them for recording and better understanding. My role will be to coordinate the order of uh, discussions. And as mentioned, I would like to start and to begin the discussion if there is any comment to chapter two to four, which describes situation uh, in Europe, which describes uh, the costs of, of pain, the costs of all the problems um, connected with pain. Please show up if you have any remarks or recommendations for chapter two to four. Okay, I can see no hands. Fine. So two to four, if, if anything pops up later in the discussion, it's no problem. We can always come back to two to four. If not, then I think we should spend some time on chapter five. We will spend some time on chapter five. Um, my, my recommendation, my question to you is whether it's okay that we try to put out of discussion any of the indicators existing. You can see the indicators, you can see the draft paper on the screen now, and we will, if the group agrees to make changes, if all the experts agree to make changes, we will immediately put them into the document, and after the break we will be able to show you the final draft document. So, um, we have to start somewhere, 
my first question is the indicator A1, existence of a national pain strategy. There is understanding within the expert group that if a country has a national pain strategy, this is a clear indicator for the quality of pain treatment is in this country. I mean, this is a very basic indicator. Yeah? But I would like to start with the easy one, <laughs> not to start with the more difficult ones, because in, in terms of putting something out of discussion, we can proceed much, much uh, faster. Existence of a national pain strategy. Is this okay for everybody here? Okay, please. Red bucket. Okay. okay. I, I don't doubt that it is important, but I propose from the outset to make this distinction that I said before. <coughs> so, uh, sorry. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> need some water. You know, I, yeah, I need some water. I, I was chewing one of these and. Yeah, don't <laughs> So my suggestion is to, to okay. differentiate recommendation from indicators. And this is maybe is a good recommendation, but it's not a good indicator. Actually, it's not an indicator at all, because there has no any evidence that this is important for the, I mean, maybe it's, it's face validity is there, but for instance, from the example that I saw, um, Italy has even a law but it doesn't mean they are doing better than in another countries without the law. So it's a recommendation, but it's not an indicator. I think this difference should be there in the document. Uh, could we then uh, use this differentiation between recommendation and a hard evidence indicator for the whole document? I think that's my purpose. That is the evidence on which that assertion is based. I would argue it's very strongly against um, saying recommendation. If, if we are to choose indicators, we choose indicators, and we are recommending those indicators. But the existence of a pain strategy seems to drive quality improvement. That was the um, evidence on which that's based. And there are multiple countries beyond Italy that have pain strategies. Um, and next door to me in Wales, they have a very good pain strategy, and we've measured the outputs from that. And it seems to we, we found a big difference between that between in Wales and England. And I think that's largely because of the existence of a formal pain strategy. It's, it's on the IS website. Yeah. Um, since we were talking about validity, we have to distinguish in validity the different levels. So there's phase, construct, and predictive validity. And clearly, it's, it will be easy for this meeting to talk about phase validity and maybe even for construct validity. So you could uh, construct a mechanism how a national pain plan should improve the quality of care. But where we have a problem is predictive validity. And this is what we had as a discussion before. So um, I think we have very little evidence how the predictive validity of any of the measures really is to improve a healthcare system. So just talk to my Portuguese colleague. There have been pioneers in having national pain strategy, and the French likewise. And I think one of the things we have learned from them is that it takes painfully long for any of the measures that you can take to really change any of the outcome parameters. So I would suggest that when we talk about validity, we should say face and construct is what we can talk about. And predictive, if we make that a criterion, then we can stop now and go for dinner, because there won't be anything left. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's a principal question. Uh, we discussed it beforehand. If, if we only rely on, on very robust, and um, I'm fully with, with uh, comment from Professor Saturno. If you only rely on indicators with a very, very hard scientific background, 
it, number one, might be difficult to communicate this to politicians, and number two, the question is we are, we are really moving on a very high political level. We are not moving on a, on a level of uh, healthcare studies, not only. And I agree, we need indicators which are good evidence as well. But on the other hand, I think for politicians, for people making decisions in terms of money spent, of funding, of, of diseases to be on a, on a high focus, on a high treatment level, we also need simple indicators to make things move on a political level. And you, it might be very difficult to find an evidence for a national pain strategy itself. If it is implemented well or poorly, this might make a big difference. I mean, those, these two indicators are connected. One, on one hand, you have a pain strategy. On the other hand, it's not implemented. Fine, it wouldn't work. But I think it might be even worse, you don't even have one. Because then you can't, you can't approach a politician and say, look, here, this should be done. If you don't even have something that should be done, it's difficult. Uh, Chris Fischer, I think this is a very important indicator, can be a very important one, but it's an indicator where a lot of work should be done on the details because you should describe what is a pain strategy. Otherwise, it's impossible for a society or for the health insurance companies or whatever, the Ministry of Health, to know what is the strategy. I will always answer yes on this indicator. If you have a national society, you will say yes. So I think a lot of work for the scientific societies and professional societies should be in to define what is a national pain strategy. And then we can agree on that point. So it should be elaborated more in the future. OK, so uh, could, we agree, could we agree to say, yes, it is an indicator, but it has to be defined what we understand by national pain strategy? It, it can be from the level four, so the, the lowest level of evidence, expert opinion. So I think that a society, EFIC in this case, can make a definition of what is a pain, national pain strategy. And then you have a good evidence level, which is in the, the processing of indicators. Can, can I just say, ISP has done this. It's defined the, the desirable characteristics of a national pain reference strategy. 21. It's, re, yeah, it's reference, thank you, <laughs> reference 21 in there. So it's, it's all been done. Um, and uh, it, was, it was carried out by Public Health in Washington uh, who supported IASP. So I think it's reasonably rigorous, absolutely accept about the issue about um, predictive validity. And perhaps we can you know, sort of direct that from some future research might be helpful in this area, but it, it seems to actually tick a number of boxes. Uh, all of them are going to be potentially have gaps in the um, high scientific level. But um, I think it's, you know, we've got to be pragmatic with this as well. Excuse me. Can you say something? Because I am from Italy. The, the law in Italy is something different as you have in China. Because it's so, now, after the law, we have three type of indicator inside the law. Because any other system have to, uh, to realize a plan in which they have to take in any part of the patient if there is pain, how they have detected that, and what they have done to take away the pain. So the indicator error. There is in your document that you have looked if patient is in pain, yes or not. Which is the intensity of pain, and so with different number scale or something else, have you done or not? Which is the strategy that you have used in that patient? So, it is a model to change the organization of our system because the law says that you have to do that because if you don't do that, you cannot close your document for that person. I think that is the first step that we have to do to indicate that it is possible to, to put inside a, a nation something that gives a recommendation that is not only a stranger recommendation, but is a law, which you have to done. Okay, the strongest thing is always to connect it to, to, to funding. Yeah? If, if funding is connected to a law, then it's, then it's uh, yes. followed. Okay. What, what, if we, what if we try to include involvement of national scientific societies to the national pain strategy? Something uh, you would agree? 
that the national scientific societies have to be involved by defining this pain strategy? Yes, I think so. They have to do on. Okay. So, the indicator itself, this is something that we can agree upon without saying it's, it's very high evidence or it's low evidence. The indicator itself, okay? I would like to say that we are talking about the structure. So, uh, we will, won't find many uh, evidence on efficacy of uh, indications, indica indicators about uh, uh, integrated care processes, uh, clinical practice guidelines, or even a national strategy. We would need uh, a randomized control trial uh, comparing uh, uh, places that the plan has been implemented and other that don't. And, say, and see the changes, but it's um, highly improbable uh, to, to have this. So, uh, sh shall we have uh, extraction indicators? So, this could be one. Uh, we could have uh, integrated, integrated care processes, implementation of clinical practice guidelines, uh, resources, people resources, uh, mm, Unit okay. for treatment of pain, anything, but this one, uh, I, in, my, in my opinion, is, is valid in, in the uh, e even uh, if it hasn't got enough evidence. Okay, so we will come to the other ones you have mentioned anyway, I'm pretty sure. Um, to my understanding, a national pain strategy can't be worsening situation for patients, to put it quite simple. Okay, and if you look, if you look at it in a very pragmatic way, if there is a strategy, it's, I think it might always be better than if there is no strategy at all. And as it was mentioned, there are not, not enough outcome indicators at the moment to say, well, it's a good indicator or it's a bad indicator, but it is one which is evident even to politicians. And by this indicator, I think you can get the most influence on politicians. Yeah? So, to my understanding, if there is no strong evidence in this group against this indicator, uh, let, let, let's Let's have it there for a the moment and proceed to the next one. Which, well, I need some explanation. Existence of national guidelines for diagnosis and treatment of different chronic pain disorders. Well, this plays into guidelines in general. Is, is this correct, my understanding? Um, would you just go? Um, I think this actually falls out of actually having a national pain strategy. I mean, we set up a national pain strategy in Wales. It was based on uh, robust evidence as we could make it at the time. And that was the way that we persuaded the Welsh Assembly Government to accept pain as a chronic condition in its own right. So I think having um, your strategy is where you would house your national guidelines uh, because that then puts it in context and gives those guidelines a background. So the German perspective would be uh, we don't have a national pain strategy that is official other than the German Pain Society having declared one. So we would say criteria one would be good, but we don't have it. But we have a long list of high quality guidelines that have been produced evidence-based to the highest level of standards. Where we see a problem is whether these guidelines are implemented. So from the German perspective, the existence of guidelines is more of a structure indicator. So those are the easy ones. <laughs> and implementation of guidelines is the process that we are still struggling with. And actually, maybe this point A2 should actually have a list of the conditions, because pain is not just pain. We don't need a pain guideline, but actually specific guidelines, like uh, the ones mentioned in the Spanish project, where, where you quote it's very specific one for the different conditions. Uh, my, my, my position is that uh, the guidelines must exist, but also put into action. There's a lot, a lot of uh, literature uh, telling us that physicians don't, don't uh, follow up, follow the, the guidelines and the recommendations. So you have to have the, the integrated care process of the guideline, but put it into action and see the results. Uh, we, we won't uh, ask for see the results of the guideline, but at least uh, the country or the, the organization has guideline, uh, put it into action, develop and put it into action. 
Okay, so what, what I take from here is, number one, the kind of pain disorders should be defined. Okay, this is uh, what, what I learned first. And number two, I think to put it into action, to make physicians behave differently, that's difficult. <laughs> Uh, this can only be done together with a pain strategy. This can only be done together with sick funds, together with politicians who, who have influence. I'm sorry, I'm Cathy Price. I'm clinical lead on the national pain audit in um, England and Wales. Um, and we've j just looking, thinking we've got NICE in the UK, which um, is it, when, they, when NICE say something, you, you, you're almost obliged to do it. You would be very questioned by that. So if I think the thing about implementation is if you have government funded guidelines um, th that are mandatory then they happen and um, that's, it's, it's, it's that level of governmental support um, that determines um, the, the degree to which they're implemented to some extent. Professor Chris. Back to uh, activate my microphone now. So I think that is one point, but only in those countries where the government is governing the national health care system. Because otherwise, otherwise the economy is striving whether or not you are following the guidelines. That is the problem. In most countries, the pain medicine as all other aspects in medicine are driven by economy. They are not driven by guidelines. That is our problem. And so what, what I would suggest is, because I have now realized there is some confusion about what is a structure indicator, can a structure indicator also be at the same time a process indicator? And I think yes, because we have already heard in the beginning from all the other presenters that there is an interrelationship, of course, between outcome indicators, structure indicators, process indicators. And of course it is important, first of all, in my opinion, it's just a suggestion, to have a structure indicator. But as the colleague from Spain has said, structure indicators are one thing, but on the other hand, they must also be used, for example, guidelines to change the situation. So I think, again, one indicator of structure quality is that there is a guideline. But it is also a process indicator, then, that the guideline is used and how much the guideline is used in a country. And I think we should discuss this under these aspects, because otherwise we will never end. We will never end with this discussion, just as a suggestion. Well, I fully agree. Process indicators is then the following of a guideline, or if you do not follow, why? That it's well documented, etc. So um, we, we take into the I protocol, sorry? Excuse me. I think that is also too much as specific that terms, you know, because exist guideline is, is something that is so different in any part of the nation, in any part of the European, which kind of guideline, which kind of expert group for internal medicine, for physiology, is not an indicator, it's something goes so different for any type of pain, for any type of uh, disease. I think that we have to modify something that exists, uh, something like exists an uh, uh, indicator for that kind of pain, or exists some uh, guidelines that are validated. It, it's so much specific, I think, because in any part, I think, in any county, in any nation, there is a lot of guidelines. And any people look at the guidelines and take in operating room to do that or in internal medicine to do that. But how are it possible to look the indicator if it is done or not? Where is possible to standardize that? I don't think that is a real indicator. Is there a recommendation to use guideline during that work? 
It's fair of all difference, I think. Well, there is always the freedom of the physician to decide whether he follows a guideline or not. Uh, but I think the role of a guideline is to define a minimum level. No yes, but it is in your uh, organization of uh, work that you have to do that. Because if you don't do that, there is also a problem in your organization. Because I don't think that anyone can go in hospital to do what they want, no? I think that anyone have a level of organization or something guidelines, but which we choose, what we want standardized. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm reproducing somehow the, some of the discussion that we had in the in the expert group. Um, we are, I think, that we agree the structure may be important but not sufficient. So if, if we get, if we eventually have this type of indicators or recommendations, first it will be good if uh, there is some evidence. It doesn't need to be randomized trial. It can be observational. It can be comparing region or countries or whatever. It's better if there is some evidence that having the guideline is better than not having the guidelines or having the national strategy is better than not having them. I mean, the level of evidence, there are many levels, but I don't want to discuss this. What I'm trying to uh, explain now is that uh, I think that we agree that if we have eventually some structural indicators or recommendations, the message for the politicians is that they should never be alone because they are not sufficient. If they really want to do something to improve the yep. management of pain, they have to do something more, like having process indicators, other type of controls or, or things to do so that they guarantee somehow, there is some guarantee that the guidelines are being implemented, that the strategy is being implemented, and all this type of thing. So, uh, it's okay if you wish to put this structural indicator because they are visible, they are easy to measure, etc. But this should be said that this will never be enough. I agree. I think Professor Trader has something to add. From Italy, uh, it's easy to say, to say uh, guideline uh, of good quality. Uh, the tool for, for seeing the quality of guidelines is agree. Uh, that is important because uh, guidelines could be uh, dangerous and, and make harm to, to patients and, and, uh, because some of them are, are made by GovSat, good old boys sitting around the table. Uh, it, that's unacceptable. Uh, so just saying uh, there are guidelines is not enough. It must be uh, good quality uh, guidelines and, and the way is to uh, with agree uh, to okay no yeah there's a limit to the number of buttons that can be pressed apparently <laughs> um, so i think we should add to this text evidence based yeah. guidelines um, i think this is a point that you wanted to make and in germany we started out with eminence-based, and we're moving strongly towards the evidence-based guidelines. I think it's also an important point where there could be a European action. So if we come up with good European-level guidelines, you, the only thing that's left for the national bodies is to translate and check the, the, the availability of the treatments and would make it actually easier for the national guidelines to be developed. So I think it has uh, a certain construct validity also in that it, there is a mechanism how an improvement could be brought about at the European level. It's not uh, predictive validity yet. We don't know what happens in different countries. But I think the construct validity is clearly there for evidence-based. I fully agree with you. They have to be evidence-based. Thank you. It's already added. Uh, my question is whether it has to be national guidelines. Or can we delete the word national? I mean, it's just a word, but uh, is it really necessary? High quality. Yeah, high quality, because there are some Okay. Okay. 
And I think maybe it should be adoption of evidence-based national guidelines as opposed to existence, because you, you want somebody... No, that's, that's a process. That's a process. Oh, that's a process, sorry. Okay, so existence of evidence-based high-quality guidelines. But okay. I think that we have also to subdivide, me, to subdivide it in patient and now patient because there are two different models of guidelines. Yeah, but this is uh, then part of the guideline itself for whom it is a guideline and for whom not. I think this is within the document of the guideline. I fully agree. I think the whole discussion can be brought to a can be focused on a very simple thing I remember from my time as a student, as a medical student. And there was a German saying, I tried to translate it. To work according a certain thinking within a medical system, within a medical school, is better than not to follow such rules. So to have rules is always better, I think, than not to have rules. And under this aspect, I would see the existence of high quality guidelines. And that should, I think, should be agreed upon as a general indicator of quality. Because if there are no rules, no guidelines, existing in a system, then everything is possible. Everything can be done. And I think that is not quality. Quality should follow certain evidence-based high quality rules. And therefore, I think the point guidelines should exist is an indicator for quality structural quality, of course, but later on, if they are followed by a majority of physicians or they are followed uh, by the system as such, then it's also a process indicator, a good one. And it should be reflected in the outcome indicators one day as well, of course. Can, okay. can I change existence and to put utilization it is better because the existence I think that there is, but utilization perhaps not. But the prerequisite to follow a guideline is that it exists. <laughs> I think that is the prerequisite. Okay, and but after okay, but okay. you have existing guidelines, then you can follow them. I would, I would like, sorry, I would like to add the utilization of the guidelines under process indicators. Is this okay with you? Yeah. Fine. Good. Uh, the red color just means there is work to do. So. Not, not it's dangerous. <laughs> okay, the next point is very complex, multidisciplinary approach for treating chronic pain as a structure indicator. As a structure indicator. My question, very simple. Isn't the structure we need many disciplines who are trained in pain treatment? Many different Specialities in medicine trained in pain treatment as a structure indicator? Just a question. Yeah. I think the training is a good structure indicator. It's, yeah, it doesn't itself lead to anything, but okay. it's, it's a structure. Yeah, so from, from, uh, the perspective, Microphone, please. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. it's, it's woken oh, up now. Um, yeah, from um, uh, an English, uh, UK perspective, we recommended our, our findings from our national audit where we measured all of these sorts of things, that um, education of, uh, of healthcare professionals was a very key thing um, and that um, the lack of um, structured education, particularly for physiotherapists and psychologists, was really hindering progress in pain, ma in pain management. So... I, I just think an edu addition of um, education is a really key, important structural indicator that wasn't included in the Spanish yeah. ones, but is I noticed in the German ones, and we've included it in yeah. our in our UK ones. Okay, so uh, before training comes availability. Yep. I mean, there have to be experts that you can train, and there have to be physicians no, specialized. No, experts by training. Okay. And, so, it, and, it, and it's, it's, it's you know, actually, the, the big lack is in um, non-physicians. It's the physiotherapists, actually, the biggest hole in the UK, and psychologists not far behind in terms of training availability. Okay, so we should add an, another structure indicator for 
trained experts for pain treatment. That is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> find expert in every country and that is not the case that is not true and therefore I would suggest in addition to what we have just discussed about training also a structural prerequisite would be to have some kind of certificate or diploma of education on a national level that allows to define and describe what a pain physician is. That is, in my opinion, also a prerequisite, a, a general structural indicator that in a country or in a system, one is seriously thinking about the role of pain medicine. Because if you have not defined what is a pain physician, you have not seriously thought about what is pain medicine and what's the role of pain medicine in treating patients. But why only physicians and not psychologists and nurses and so on? So we must think about multidisciplinary or multimodal because uh, what really works uh, uh, level up uh, quality is to use Inter, uh, pharmacological intervention and non-pharmacological intervention. Uh, doesn't matter too much if you put uh, several uh, physician, nurses, and so on in a uh, pain unit or in primary care, uh, several um, uh, people working with the same uh, patient, giving exercise, giving uh, cognitive uh, behavior uh, therapy, and good uh, management of uh, uh, medications. Can, excuse me. Can we uh, change to so expert physician or expert pain physician work in a team of, <laughs> don't take away, work in a team with a multidisciplinary model for pain treatment? We can say so. Because I think that multidisciplinary is something in which anyone can stay, no? But I think that we need that in a multidisciplinary, the first one is the pain spare physician that we have to put inside. Okay. Um, so to actually work in this multi-professional context, this is process, very important. But to be able to work in that context, you have to have the experts in the first place. So you have PTs, you have to have uh, psychologists who know about pain, and medical doctors. So for okay. the structure indicators, we're still talking about the education. So availability of trained pain treating specialists, and I think that should contain a list of at least uh, doctors, psychologists, and physical therapists, and probably it's even longer than that. If we have to uh, analyze that f phrase, like multidisciplinary expert team, or a, an expert team work with a multidisciplinary model, they are two different minds. I think that is better multidisciplinary model that is using in expert team. That the expert team can be well, you, I think three, four, five people. You're talking about the same thing with, with different perspectives. Yes. Uh, for, for people working together, being able to work together, you need the people. No, yes, no. Yeah, that's simple. But well, you're talking about the same, I think. We, no, he he yes, just wants to have We to can have also people that is not an expert group, no? It's not an expert team. So we can have internal medicine, physician of uh, rehabilitation or psychologists, but they are not experts in pain, and they can do a multidisciplinary model. We need to emphasize, I think, that the chronic pain must be taken on by a model of multidisciplinary expert team. Then in the multidisciplinary, you can put inside what do you think is better? But that we need a model of expert group. Okay. Uh, would you agree to the suggestion availability of trained pain treating specialists? We are still in structure parameters, not in the process. Okay. Sorry, the infrastructure in place to train those people? What's the structure for training? 
Is the infrastructure for training is well, in place? Open for discussion. The, the, the question is, is the infrastructure for training a quality indicator for pain treatment of patients? I think the infrastructure is a quality indicator and it is not in place in all countries. Again, <laughs> and that is the reason why in many countries there is no pain specialist. And so one should, one should of course also think about is the infrastructure already available in a country and that could be an indicator of quality. Could everybody I, uh, everybody uh, agrees? Pro propose that we take out the A3 and move it down to process because we've been discussing the multidisciplinary approach. But I think we're now at the point to define what has to be in place to get the diff disciplines trained so that they are available. I think we all agree that a master disciplinary approach is a good thing, but it seems to be out of place where it's put. So maybe if you could shift okay. it down to process, we'll get to back, back to that later and can focus on the structure. Okay, indicators. makes sense. Makes sense. So we still have the question, I mean, A4 now, which will become the new A3 probably in some seconds, is availability of trained pain treating specialists. Um, should we replace specialists by experts? I mean, a specialist has the advantage you can cover different specializations. Physiotherapists, psychologists, physicians. It's expert is always connected with physician, I, I'm, I'm afraid of. Could we... Could Maybe also oh, but is a physiotherapist an expert? Well, probably. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Availability. Well, we need the people. In, in structure quality, we need the people, not the training. The training is a process. We need the people, and how do we call the people? I'm, I'm, we, can, we can stay on specialist for the moment. We can discuss it later, if that's fine. As a next point. Okay, okay. Availability of training process for programs for pain treating specialists. Training programs, okay, for. Okay. But. Sorry, I, th I think the, again, you're going to have problems with looking at training programs per se. I think they should be um, the training program should actually be based on competencies that are derived from the professional organization. So they have to be professionally endorsed training programs. Um, and I think it should be pain management specialists, not pain treatment specialists. So I think the availability of professionally um, endorsed uh, training programs for pain management specialists. Professionally endorsed, okay. We include professionally endorsed, and then you said for, instead of pain treating, pain management? Yeah, pain management specialist, because I think that opens it up to people who are okay. not, who are That's fully agreed. And, yeah. I can add perhaps the official words which we use at European level, that certified, board certified or certified trained people. So then you have a national or an European or even an international level. Yeah. And we have certified, and the second step will be registered, because it should be somebody who is daily busy with pain, and not somebody who did it five years ago. So you should add two words, registered and certified. Is this okay? Certified and registered. Okay. What do you need? Like a phone book. You can look in some register whether this certification is still valid or he did it 30 years ago. I mean, how often have you been driving behind a car driven by a 90-year-old guy on a highway? <laughs> he, had his, he made his license 60 years ago. Huh? That's a problem, even in medicine. Maybe worse. I have a, a little problem with this because the majority of the chronic pain patients will be available within the general practitioners, and we are discussing only the specialists now. 
Uh, so I, I think that we also have to have a level concerning the general practitioners. And, and in Sweden, we are discussing the lack of education within um, uh, the undergraduate, uh, for that undergraduate students of, of the, the medical students. So I think there, there is uh, several other problems. The majority of patients uh, will not need to meet a, a specialist. And we, it, in several uh, countries, it will not be possible to meet a specialist. I agree, but what but, but you said does not exclude A3. It's, it's an addition. It's an addition. Okay, fine. The next suggestion is that the GP has to be trained in a better way. I think uh, what this amounts to is uh, some like availability of basic training in pain medicine for all healthcare professionals, right? I think that's what you're asking for. Not when they're GPs, but when they finish medical school or are clinical psychologists or physical therapists or whatever. Okay. One could define it as a basic undergraduate education of every medical student in a country. If that is fulfilled, that could be a quality criterion. And again, we have to be careful not to mix an indicator of quality and recommendations. Of course, it can be, it should be recommended that also primary care physicians are well trained. But is the training of primary care physicians a uh, structure indicator of a system, or is it just something that is wishful, that should be done, but is not helpful as an indicator of the quality of the system? So we have to think about these aspects. It's, it's weak. No. But, the, the, but all structural indicators are weak. Are weak, yes, all are weak. But we have to, I think we have to think about the most important dominant ones that should have, and I don't know the evidence so far, that should have most influence on the quality of pain management in a country or in a system. Mm -hmm. I, think, I, sorry. I, I think, oh, sorry, I'm a, an educationalist, and I think um, you need, it, from a structural perspective, you need to have um, uh, pain specialists available in order to um, educate others in appropriate ways. So from a structural perspective, I think, a, for me, A3 rings true because you need those people in place in order to be training GPs, in order to be training undergraduates. If you don't have them, you can't train other people up. So I think from a structural perspective, you know, that is the process. And then from a process indicator perspective, they're available then to educate GPs and uh, at undergraduate, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems to be a prerequisite for the, for the system to have those people in place, okay? Um, we're still talking about structure, structure quality indicators for pain treatment. Yeah. Any? Yes, briefly. I, I know that I'm against a little bit against the stream, but I have to. And um, first, I like to insist again about the evidence part. The best structural indicator is this indicator who has some evidence that this is better than not having that, not just because we think it's good or bad. And the second I like to stress is that for any indicator, you have to define every single word in the indicator. Otherwise, you don't know what you are measuring. Just imagine some politician or some technician in the Ministry of Health looking at A3. Availability of professionally endorsed programs for certified and registered pain treating specialists. Now, what is this? How will I measure this? If you don't explain what type of programs, what is the meaning of certified, maybe in that country that, that thing does not exist. Why do you need a specialist? What do you think? I mean, every single word has to be defined, and um, I don't think this is useful. I agree it has to be defined, but there are for sure, there are indicators which are very simple in, in, uh, in the values. It's yes or no. Yeah, but um, maybe for some country they think different things. And um, I give you another example, very simple. 
the, the unit for treating pain. In some places, they are staffed by physicians. I mean, some of them are, lay, are led by nurses. In some other places, are led by other type of health teams. So if you don't define what is better, what is good, or if everything is good. No, no I fully agree. I mean, we have written lists to be defined, that the specialists have to yeah, be defined. Yeah, but you have to define everything, because professionally endorsed programs, what is that? Yeah, but university program is a professional endorsed yeah. program. Yes. Yeah, but I, but I have another. Uh, I will not discuss more this is better or not better, the structure, but now the issue is the definition, the definition, because for this particular indicator, I, I was able to, to gather the, the reference. And then if you do all the things that is here, I mean, it's, it's wonderful, because they have uh, a structure, they have staff, they have research, they have audit, they have everything. And this is the reference for the evidence of this indicator. Can you, can you please use the microphone? You hardly understand. Okay. I think that it is really very different from any countries. And the available is that for that country and not for the other one. But we have to say that any country needs to have an available for people that is going inside a program to do it. Because sometimes there is also people that do it, pain treatment of diagnosis without have any available. Okay, may I, may I just remind you to one of my opening remarks. We are we, we, we will not deliver perfection here. That's clear. In, in no way. That's not possible in, in terms of time restriction, in terms of number of involved people. What we are trying here is to deliver a set of indicators, either evidence-based, coming out from the, from the scientific work that has been done, or agreed by the group by common sense. It's a mixture. And if you, if you want, we can, we can mark these indicators, uh, group one or group two, strong evidence or just recommendations from the group. That's, that's fine. Yeah. No, the fine is, it exists or not exist. A program that valuable people that is able to do it. Because it is a list of of knows that you have to to done to your people, no? It is different in USA, I think, than in Italy or in Germany. Look. But in any country, it must be a list what you have to done and what you have to know. So it doesn't matter who or what type of uh, profession. We cannot also do a list of 300 or no, 1,000. No, no. <laughs> but uh, what you should have a specialist in pain medicine, nursing specialist in pain medicine, psychologists specialized in pain medicine, social workers specialized in pain medicine. I mean, the list can be very big. All of them are equally good. You just get one, one, two, three, four. Uh, what I, are you looking for? I, I, I agree. The list won't be perfect from the beginning. But, this, but that, that should be specified. What is the a, meaning of that? No, but the looking? indicator is not the list. The indicator is exist or not exist. A program to do it. Sorry. <coughs> yes. I think that, in my opinion, the simplest is the best. I think that... Uh, the item A2 and the items A3 are included in A1, and that should be the only item. In, that's my opinion. You can describe later what do we understand as a national plan strategy, okay? But I think that, uh, in my opinion, the only structure indicator should be this one, the A.1. Okay. 
please. We agree with you. Um, we think that the, the, the list to be defined must uh, to be in the A1 uh, indicator. Uh, as a not, not uh, like is now a multidisciplinary approach, is a principle of a, a national pain strategy. We can define a list of principles or focus of a pain strategy. And in this point, we uh, in Spain, it's uh, impossible now to, to achieve this, in, this indicator, to have pain, pain treating specialists. We propose to promote or to have uh, training programs for each uh, professional, health professional involved in pain treatment. Psychologists, uh, general practitioners, uh, nurses, basic programs. Okay. Cosa Cas? I would just come back to what is an indicator. In my opinion, maybe I'm totally wrong, in my opinion is an indicator something that can be counted or measured. The problem with the existence of a national pain strategy is that it cannot be counted and it cannot be measured. You can just say, yes, we have a pain strategy. That's it. Therefore, we need measurable or countable indicators. And I think what is measurable and countable is, for example, whether or not you have certified or registered specialists in this field. That is countable, measurable and definable because it is defined either by a national law or by a professional body and the rules that are given by this professional body, for example, the medical association, the national medical association of a country. And what we have to accept is that in different European countries, these hierarchies are different. In one country, it is the government that is giving it by a law. In another country, it's the medical association. In the third country, it's the single uh, university. But the university can only, I think it should be a national program. We can only accept, for example, a university degree when this degree has also a consequence for the practice of pain medicine or for the acceptance of such a specialist within the country. It must have a consequence. If it's without any consequence, it is not an indicator of quality because we have many of certificates without any consequence that, in my opinion, are not indicators of quality or what as whatsoever. So, but, but I, I'm not, I'm not uh, of the opinion that just existence of a national pain strategy is enough because it is not a hard indicator that can be measured or counted. It is just yes or no, but what means yes? Yes, we have something written on paper. Yes, we have an idea. We have an, maybe we have, we have a, a vision. But that is not quality. Everybody has a vision. And we had a former chancellor who said someone who has a vision should visit and consult a psychiatrist. So I think we should be aware of the risk when we have such a weak uh, indicator that it will be useless. OK, just, just one remark for an indicator. I, I agree with what you said, measurable, countable, OK. But there are indicators on off. There are some indicators where you can only say yes or no, but it's still an indicator. But I fully agree, if there are numbers, it's, it's easier to compare, it's easier to measure. The question is again back to the national pain strategy. I mean, again, pragmatism versus, if you want, science. A, a national pain strategy plan itself doesn't improve anything, I agree. Well, it's, it's a, if you're going to have a strategy, it's, um, you know, my, my chief exec would always say, you'd sack me unless actually I told me how I was going to do it. And um, so a strategy has to say how you're going to deliver it. And there, there's plenty of evidence on, on the impact of service frameworks and strategies across a whole broad variety of diseases. So, for example, the cardiovascular framework in the UK, the obesity strategy, where they've, they've, it's achieved big things and it's brought about quite a lot of change. Um, what we, I think, the, the, I think we're getting quite hung up here on yeah. structure indicators because all we're doing is saying this is this is the um, 
the glue that holds the rest of it together. And we're getting to a lot of detail here, whereas actually if we move in on the process and outcomes, we'll start to find actually this glue starts to look, um, it starts to have some meat on it a bit further down. So I'd make a plea to not get too hung up on the structure yeah. and just see them as you know, a necessary part of, of trying to deliver a whole series of process and outcome indicators. Okay, that's, that's fine with me. Yes, please. Probably units for a specialized pain treatment fits to this frame. Okay. So specialized units, especially for pain patients. Mm -hmm. Could as well be a plan of a national pain strategy to establish these units. I think everything can be part of the national yes. pain strategy. Yeah. So we can list this one point and go home. <laughs> but okay. uh, then I think we're not specific enough. So. I agree that we should move on to something else, but there's still this uh, proposal from Sweden that we haven't mentioned basic education of all the healthcare professionals on pain, which is a major gap in many places. So I think that needs to be listed. Okay. And then Nibenka's remark, there's some countable parameters that some people like to count, number of pain specialists, number of this, number of that. And we haven't started to discuss whether these are useful, desirable as indicators. If they are, they're just structural indicators. But maybe we agree that they're not indicators that we want. So my suggestion is to add this point of um, uh, education on, on, on principles of pain for all healthcare professionals, and then move on to a discussion education. Um, that was just started. Do we have, want to have some countable education. things in the uh, that that might make sense? Okay, so we add now the education of principles of pain for all healthcare professionals. Just for discussion open. The second point, numbers. I mean, yes, I agree. If we had some numbers, let's say pain specialists per, se per thousand people or per 10,000 inhabitants, that's a hard number you can measure. The question again will be, where is, where is the evidence? Can I do a proposal? I think the, the point of view of patients is really underestimated now in our structure. So I, what I would uh, propose is making an indicator that every patient in a country should have access to a pain management facility at a maximum distance for 30 to 40 kilometers. And the Belgium example is very clear in that. You should be, you have a geographical uh, offer for pain all over the country. Otherwise, when you are looking to the indicator for the endorsed programs, then you have a treatment facility at 100 kilometers from your home. So that's much too far for patients. So I should propose an indicator that every patient can have access to treatment facilities or management facilities. And a next step can be that primary care is involved in this indoor endorsed program. Then the treatment facility or the management program should have contact with primary care, how we should manage a better care for patients. And this is structure. Okay, the suggestion was um, accessibility for patients. Accessibility. As a structure quality indicator. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Disagreed upon? Every patient should have easy access. It's not a disagreement, it's a now remark. You have to measure it. So you have to define accessibility, what is the meaning of accessibility and to what. You, you can measure it. We have examples in, uh, in Belgium, for example. Yeah, but uh, you have to define it. Yeah. It will be different sure. in Finland and in Belgium, that's clear. Yeah. What's, what's accessibility, yeah? And, uh, and um, for instance, in my country, just having access to primary health care centers, in some cases, is enough. So. And the indicators that we have measured in some cases in primary health care were better than in the hospitals. Of the performance. So accessibility is not Please. that easy. Uh, and Berke and Belgium. Um, we have the, maybe a geographical criteria, but the question is, is maybe not the, the number of kilometers, patients. but the number of patients per pain center. And we have, we have looked at, at that in, in a the, uh, a meeting, there's no uh, recommendation in internationally on how many pain specialists per patient or per thousand patients. We don't know that. But if we, we, we see in Belgium, we, we will have 36 centers. 
This, according to epidemiology, means that we would have 22,000 patients per center. So it's, it's not a good indicator, I think. The, the education of all, of all caregivers is much better. What, what, what was this? Uh, excuse me, was it already? That's, I mean, this was the last suggestion, accessibility of pain treatment for patients. We don't know the kilometers, we don't know how many specialists we need per thousand patients. But I think accessibility should be included in structure. Okay. Is this agreed? Okay. Okay. Sorry, for the accessibility, I think that one indicator which is very interesting is the waiting time before to have your consultation is easiest, I think, to agreed. measure. Agree. I mean, this can be included in accessibility. It's, it's room and time, space and time, okay? But I think it's a, it's a very hard parameter for a structure of a, of a healthcare system. Okay, so I would like to follow the recommendation proceeding to process and maybe coming back to structure afterwards, okay? Uh, here is our old friend, multidisciplinary approach, treating chronic pain. He came from A, now he's B, which is no rating, okay? Make a radical proposal that we may want to discuss outcome indicators first, first because when Hans was mentioning uh, waiting times, in, in some contexts it had been listed as an outcome parameter. Someone just discussed it as a structural parameter and it may be a process indicator. So okay. it has a major influence. So if, if waiting times would be outcome parameters, then any program that shortens waiting times is, can be validated that way. I, I don't, don't want to suggest that this is a wise strategy to do, but I think we should talk about what the outcome indicators are, because they have a huge influence on anything else that we will discuss. Fine with me. So let's, let's switch to outcome. We, I think there are only two proposals, what I know, which is pain relief and quality of life. I mean, now we're down, down, up at the patient level, okay? Now we are at the target of the whole healthcare system at the patient. What are outcome indicators you could imagine for the quality of pain treatment in a, in a given society? I already sent a document based on impact recommendations and also uh, on American Pain Society uh, about sick core domains of outcome uh, indicators. Uh, I think that uh, this indicator should include uh, physical functioning and emotional functioning. That has also uh, validated uh, scales uh, uh, widely used in, in clinical settings and also in research and uh, have evidence uh, to show that uh, it works. Uh, quality of life if uh, too, uh, not, not too much specific. So uh, should have a pain intensity or relief, that means the pain sensation, and also physical functioning that impact on daily activities and work, and emotional functions uh, means uh, impact on distress uh, and uh, depression or anxiety. That is quite important. Uh, and we have a brief pain inventory uh, interference scales that uh, could be easily uh, measured uh, in primary care uh, physical functioning. And also we have a uh, back uh, depression inventory and many other scales, Goldberg scale, to, to test uh, depression and anxiety. And we have a lot of uh, clinical guidelines like uh, those of NICE on depression and, and are uh, usually used. Uh, so why not? Why do not include this, these uh, outcome indicators? Eh? It's the way to show to the professionals that the things is, are not going well, and to improve, to to put them to to quality measures. 
Many, many times uh, professionals say, I do, I do inform the, the patients, uh, and the, the patients are, are quite well, but they don't do uh, cognitive therapy or, or think about what is happening to the patient, just the sensation, interventional procedures and pharmacological treatments. Okay. That's not quality in, in chronic pain and management. Okay, Jamie, you want to add something? Um, Sorry. The need for caregiver as well would be an important outcome because obviously that's lost work from both sides. So I think that's something that we should be considering as well. But yeah, I fully agree with what you're saying. Okay. I, talk, I think we should be more specific here because in the document of Professor Sarturno, there was a clear distinction between acute pain, between chronic pain, non-cancer pain, and cancer pain. And I think these in the outcome indicators can't be mixed up. In chronic non-cancer pain, the pain relief is not a good indicator at all in the evidence. So we should look to a different way of functioning or quality of life or whatever. Reintegration in the working place, for example, can be also a good one from the evidence. Yeah. And in cancer pain, yeah, there we can take the pain relief. And in acute pain, we do have examples, national examples of very good indicators, measuring all patients for their pain, looking how many people do have a pain level of above seven, for example, which was indicated as the best way of measuring uh, heavy pain, so this one can be used for acute pain, but make a differentiation between the three different uh, uh, places where pain can be uh, done. Can I, can I just say, we've um, tried out measuring loads of different outcome indicators um, for the last four years with a national pain audit. Um, pain relief is something that um, we've tested out what was really important to patients, to professionals, to commissioners, to payers, everybody. And um, that pain relief is actually something that's a bit of a given, to be honest, with pain services, that actually pain does need to come into it. Um, but the, I think the important point is to say that um, we issued people with a variety of questionnaires and um, that the, whilst impact has got an awful lot of, there are 300 validated questionnaires for pain, um, it's th that actually uh, they are quite difficult to actually get patients to complete and there is a, in, there's a sense of a patient in, in everyday practice difficult to get um, centres to co really complete enough. We've, we've got 10,000 patients in terms of income incoming questionnaires, we've got um, 5,000 odd outcomes and, um, at six months and then it's dropped down to 2,000 at 12 months. So you've got quite a long drop off in terms of patient questionnaires. So we have to be absolutely realistic with what we should be doing. And I'd make me not to go down the research route of multiple different questionnaires, but try and stick to the very key core ones as, as you were mentioning with things like BPI and EQ5D. What, what came out for me more from the pain audit was actually the ba um, things that should, perhaps should be in place for patients. Um, pain clinics were expecting that they gave plenty of information to services, but they did, the patients reported they don't. They don't remember having any advice on how to manage pain. They don't remember being given any information, don't remember being given any support. Mm -hmm. So actually those, those are very key core things that people think they're doing, but perhaps they're not. And um, make a plea for something a little bit more simple. The work one is a very important one that we did measure, but it was very difficult to measure, and we got very hung up on that. So I'm not sure we did it that well. <coughs> I think the, the last thing I'd say is that we've been measuring safety um, and looking at professionals' safety protocols. So have you got a safety protocol for suicidal thoughts? Have you got a safety protocol for interventional procedures? That sort of thing. And they've, they've been reasonably well collected. So in, I guess what I'm trying to say is that look at feasibility rather than trying to, trying to get too many in all at once. So sorry, it's a bit of a rant. <laughs> okay. Any further comments to pain relief as an indicator? Please. These are probably the parameters that should be implemented into an ongoing benchmarking in order to visualize the improvement in quality of care. So these need to be practical parameters. Probably it is easy uh, to have a list of uh, indicators, but 
this implies that the clinicians or the healthcare professionals uh, have more documentation load and more work to plug in all these indicators. So in Austria, we try to find indicators that are automatically uh, derived from the system. And one indicator, you mentioned safety. An indicator could probably be to look into re-hospital admissions or hospital readmissions uh, due to side effects, probable side effects of pain treatment, pharmacological treatment, such as GI bleeding, such as uh, fractures due to NSAIDs or opioid uh, effects. Another aspect is coming from the acute pain side is to simply ask about patient satisfaction, not the sophisticated quality of life uh, questionnaires, but rather only how are you satisfied with your uh, treatment, with your pain therapy. Uh, back to work, waiting times and uh, physical functioning is also what we are considering in Austria as a good outcome parameter, aside from pain relief and QL. Thank you. I mean, the parameter waiting times was mentioned several times now. Waiting times for patients until they get the treatment they need. Is this an undisputed indicator? You would say this is really this was this is what counts for patients: waiting time until you get the treatment you need. I, I think that we have to put something as index uh, disability, because the index disability is something that changes from the beginning and outcome of the patient. There is K like always three and something else that are validated. The index disability, if exists a program for the coping, so a coping program for patients. Okay. So, any comments to the, to the waiting time and to disability index? I'm sorry to come again, again, and again to the same type of things. I am reviewing the issue of the waiting time. I have with me the guidelines of the International Society. It is impossible right now to define what is the standard for waiting time. First of all, you have to define waiting time for what type of patient, because it's not the same. In this guideline, they made one, two, three, four different type of patients. And then when they go to try to define the right waiting time for each of them, the conclusion is we don't know. So I come again, an indicator should be measured and everything should yes, be very well specified. It's not of use but, but. to say waiting time is important. Yes, it is important, but how to measure it? What is the standard? What but, is the uh, specification? For the index disability, there is a lot of standards. No, no, but, it is measurable. Just, just that is different uh, as, as for if well, maybe we have some, some basic misunderstanding here. I'm not talking about standards. No, if, no, no. If no. a patient has a waiting time of three months. No, but if you just, put just, just let me finish one thought, please. If you have a waiting time of three months today for patients with acute back pain, and you, and you can decrease the waiting time to one month next year, there is no standard at all, but the treatment of patients has improved. And this is what I'm talking about. Maybe there is a misunderstanding between a good indicator and something we can measure, but there is still no standard, but it's obvious that waiting time for patients is important. Um, I, um, Mary, um, I've forgotten her surname, that um, did the waiting times document, did do some work in Canada about um, people that have been waiting more than six months um, for multidisciplinary treatment had showed a definite stepwise deterioration in care. So there is beyond six months. Um, Equally, um, for acute back pain, for example, um, the evidence is for work that if you um, have, um, if you, you should try and get on top of it between two and four weeks. And so actually there's, a, there's an argument to having as early as possible intervention for um, new onset um, back pain that's causing time off work. The, so you've got, you've got different levels of evidence in, term, in different places, and I think that's what's going to cause some problems. 
There is no different level of evidence. There are different rules. For instance, here in this guideline, there are one, two, three, four, five, six countries, and every country has different way of approaching it. <coughs> so uh, waiting time is important, but again, to put it as an indicator, it has to be well defined. And maybe the way of defining is, it is important, so we will measure how long since they approach the, the facility until they are diagnosed or treated or whatever. But it's, it has to be defined. I mean, the reality all over the world is that is not an indicator that has been uh, properly defined. And I'm, and I'm just using the, the guideline from the IASP. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's hard to understand because if a patient is waiting in one country six months, in another months, in another country three months, <laughs> I, I, I don't mm. think he cares about. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't. Think, he doesn't care about evidence. But I agree. I, I understand what you say, Dr. Trader. To me, the current discussion suggests that waiting time is a pretty good process indicator because it's measurable. You can easily design a program to shorten the waiting time. And then you can test whether it makes a difference. To me, that is all that we need for process indicators. So that it has face validity, looks good. We have no idea what the effect is. So this would mean it should be a process indicator. And the outcome indicators are of, of the type that we said pain relief plus the other things that we have mentioned. OK. Any, any comments for waiting time? As a, now it shifted to a process indicator. Process indicator, okay. Also, the, the waiting time depends on the model you, you put in action. Uh, in Andalusia, we are trying to, to implement a, an ICP, an integrated care process that put a, an, an individualized, individualized uh, plan uh, at primary care. That consists on good management of uh, medication by the GP, also an intervention by the nurse uh, with psychoeducation and uh, physical therapy, mainly uh, exercise program with the physiotherapist. That is a, a real a multimodal uh, uh, program. And, and you don't have to wait to, to, to go to the uh, pain unit. So how can you apply? Doesn't work. Doesn't work. And uh, which model is better? Uh, you could have the, 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 the main intervention uh, at, from the very beginning. You don't have to wait the, for the patient to get chronic for three years to go to the, or seven months, to go to the uh, pain unit. Okay, we have, we have B3 in your, in your draft, uh, sorry, B5, the time between onset of pain and commencement of adequate treatment, according to guidelines. So this is already included in the yeah. draft. Excuse me, how we have finished the outcome? <laughs> you have no, 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 we just, <laughs> I just wanted to show you that the waiting time is B5 included, okay? Now let's go back to the outcome. Outcome, we still have pain relief, uh, quality of life, and some suggestions. Maybe, maybe well, duration of pain treatment should be a good indicator in outcome. Duration of pain treatment. What do you mean by duration of treatment? How, how successful we are in uh, okay. treating pain. When we, when, we, when we stop, or we can. Uh, if we uh, uh, make some uh, success in pain treatment, then duration is shorter, or we can uh, assess it as ongoing, as so a chronic pain. Duration treatment. of pain is what you mean? Yes. Okay. Because you can long time be on treatment, but if the it, duration of pain is short, it's fine, no? It, it is seems it's very difficult to measure the duration because we have also to do a good diagnosis, which kind of pathology, which program. Of, I think that is very difficult to standardize a duration because it, I don't think that is good to standardize. Okay. We, we had the recommendation, the suggestion of hospital reassessment after, for example, for 
gastrointestinal bleeding as a typical side effect of long term. Could we just say adverse, ev uh, adverse yep. events or uh, adverse, yeah, incidents of adverse into events? Detail. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, incidents of adverse events due to pain treatment. Yeah. But so, who defines what is an adverse event yeah. due to pain treatment? That is not even possible in scientific clinical studies. It's always <laughs> very, very unreliable and it's always just an assumption whether this side effect is due mm -hmm. to treatment or to something else. Mm -hmm. So I think that is such a weak, right. such a weak indicator that we cannot use it. So who it's defines? It's, it's, who it's, defines? So I'm just thinking, it's a, are we saying that um, safety is a process indicator? Safety is a process yeah. indicator. That is something I fully agree. Yeah. I'm sorry, but maybe the, one of the indicator is uh, simply to calculate the number of consultation. We know that if the patient is better, he will consult less other practitioners. So maybe it's a, a solution because it's also an economical uh, topic because a patient who is not uh, relieved take a lot of medication, a lot of consultation, a lot of exam also. Um, in terms of the outcome indicators, I think we're all going to use different things in our practice and rather than get hung up on um, particular outcome measures, could we not say that we what leads patients to become chronic are issues around disability and distress. So we need to be using outcome measures that reflect disability and distress in these populations. I mean, the other thing as well is the SF36 you actually do have to pay for, and I don't think we should be advocating quality of life measures that actually incur a cost. But I, I think, again, uh, ra rather than specifying what outcome measures we should be using, is actually saying what are the things we should be measuring, um, if that makes sense. I already stressed the importance of the 3Ds, uh, disability, distress, and, and pain is, is basic. How should this be included, please? I also support uh, the addition of emotional factors, physical function, as suggested here earlier. I think that's a good idea, and not, not define the instrument used to measure them. Okay. Emotional factor, and the second was physical functioning. Physical functioning. I think we had patient satisfaction at some point. Yeah. Maybe you yeah. can enter that. I think so. Would, would, you, would you agree if we just take this as working points without first specifying it for the moment? To be included yeah. in some way or the other, these three I items, okay? It could go into the brackets of quality of life because I think there are all specifications for quality of life that are much better than SF12 or mm. SF36. Okay. So. The general concept of quality of life may still including, be valid. Including emotional function. Emotional and okay. physical function, patient satisfaction. If we look at EQ5D, that's broken down into five domains where we can yeah. put that in. But the tools are different. Yeah. Sorry. Physical Sorry. function. The tools for quality of life are quite different function. for distress. Yeah. Quite different. And for physical function. You can put it uh, hanging from quality of life, a different measure. Okay, at, at this point of time, we have it including emotional factor, physical functioning, and patient satisfaction as part as quality of life. Might well be that in, in further process, it becomes a point of its own, okay? But is this okay for the point of time? Good? I think it's a little bit strange. Isn't pain a part of quality of life? Then? So it's, I think emotional factors, physical function, and patient satisfaction are separate items in this list. Okay. Quality of life is some, something much broader, at least as I have perceived it. Uh, I agree with that. And also in research, it's, it's 
uh, is quite clear. There is no discussion on this. Okay, so each one becomes a point of its own, indicate of its own, it's yeah. okay? Because a trader can live with that? Okay. Anything else for outcome indicators? We have now pain relief, quality of life, emotional factors, physical functioning, and uh, patient satisfaction. All these as recommendations, not as evidence-based hard indicators. Physical functioning. Patient satisfaction. Anything else for outcome? Work-related work outcomes. If you want to put the safe care type of thing, the, the adverse events in, in relation to, uh, to treatment, because everything has to be defined in the study, but of course there are safe side effects and adverse events. Safety of care, mm -hmm. okay. Safety of care. I think that first moxonal factor is very difficult to analyze uh, as indicator. Eh? I think everybody agrees. <laughs> okay, may I just uh, also in terms of, of, of um, process come back to the indicators for process quality, process indicators. Um, we have general process indicators, and then we have some for specific diseases. Any comments, welcome. The begin before the meeting, we discussed a little bit. So the understanding, I think, is that any process indicator must be validated against an outcome, right? So uh, hopefully there will be many process indicators that people can up with, come up with, maybe this will be more of a research agenda to, to say, well, which process indicators can be created that are measurable in a certain healthcare environment that will improve those dimensions that we have defined as, as outcome dimensions. So rather than trying to come up with a finite list, make it general, make, make statements. So some of these are surrogate parameters like wait times. So that, that's, we've discussed this, and clearly it will, if anything, be a surrogate parameter, and we don't know whether it's a good one or a bad one. To treat someone according to guideline, actually it's also a surrogate parameter. We don't know whether they get better. Yeah. We, d we only know that the guidelines have evidence from RCTs, but we have no idea whether this makes a patient better in everyday life. So there can be some general principles that we can write, but I think there will be a long, long list of process indicators that hopefully will be tried until next year. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are exactly 32 process indicator evidence-based. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry? Okay. I mean, we are already at the process indicators. It's the uh, third and, and, and last part of, of our work to do. So any comment concerning process indicators are very welcome. Okay, let's start from the beginning, maybe it's easier. The first one is multidimensional pain-oriented clinical assessment. I mean, the result would be that pain patients are seen by more than one specialist. Is this true? Chronic pain patients. Okay. Now we are starting at B3. Oh, sorry. No, we are at the B1. Sorry, B1. Multidisciplinary approach to treating chronic pain. The outcome or the measurable result would be that chronic pain patients are seen by more than one treating specialist. How do you define chronic? <laughs> more than. Six months, I think, is the definition. Huh? More than one. Yes, more than one. Yes, more than one. 
Three months. Three months. No, no, I see uh, more than one discipline. That was the question. Multidisciplinary. What does this mean? I don't. In chronic pain. Mm. Well, the question for the group is, is it always necessary in chronic pain patients that a psychologist has to see the patient? I will tell you according to the reference what is the meaning of multidisciplinary and then you can think if you agree or not. It means uh, an specialist in pain medicine, a nurse specialist and nurse consultant, a clinical psychologist, a physiotherapy, and an occupational therapy. All this. If then you think if this is enough or is too much, or you have to add, you have to subtract. We are moving into dangerous ground here. So. <laughs> Let's take the example of psychotherapy. They're medical psychotherapy specialists. They're not the psychiatrists in Germany. They're psychosomatic medicine specialists, and they're the psychological psychotherapists. And they fight each other. Let's stay out of that. Just multidisciplinary is more than one, and clearly some psycho experience has to be in there, whether it's a medical doctor trained in that, maybe actually a nurse trained in that would do that. I don't know any evidence uh, for or con. It's very pragmatic to say multidisciplinary is more than one. This is what is then reflected in many of the rules that I have seen. That then there's specific lists, this plus that works and that plus that works, but it's not our business. Yeah, and then think of politicians. If you see more than one, they understand. Okay. <laughs> okay, and there is evidence, there is, okay, let's go to P2, utilization of evidence. This came out from the meeting today. We have defined the evidence-based guidelines and we said we need a process to utilize them. Is this agreed upon? Because only having the guidelines might be not sufficient. Please. Uh, sorry, excuse me. In the in the draft, we we doesn't have a multidisciplinary. We have multimodal or multidimensional. That means biopsychosocial uh, treatment, no uh, which uh, people are treating the, the patient. So it should be changed to multimodal and explain that at least a pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatment. Okay, so you all agree multimodal? <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> so, multimodal. Thank you. Next point was utilization of the guidelines. I think we could leave it at this point of time like it is and proceed to B3. Multidimensional pain-oriented clinical assessment. If you want to keep it in it should be uh, positions before the treatment. To me it sounds very similar but Assessment and treatment are not the same thing, so it may be useful to leave it in, but then it should move, be moved up to okay. uh, B number We will one. do that in the break. We just re rename it now to B2 and the other one to P3. The next is communication with other healthcare providers and patients. A letter summarizing result of the full pain-oriented assessment as well as multimodal treatment proposals to be sent to GP, patient, and other caregivers involved. Well, this is a, a, a huge topic, communication between specialists patients. and patients. I mean, pragmatically, the face validity, I, I think, is there. And it's also, you can imagine programs that could directly address it. And then it could be checked against any of the okay. outcome indicators. Yeah. All agree, we, we leave it as it is, OK? Next is time between, we had this, now we come to the specific uh, indications, headache, screening substance, misuse, and anxiety and depression. Everybody agrees? Okay. Well, I think this is a little bit too specific. So it's certainly a good thing, but there are more good things to be done about headaches. 
And I wonder whether this isn't covered in the point uh, so implementation of guidelines. Yeah, and because so I assume this is taken from evidence-based guidelines, all the recommendations there, at least the ones I recognize, are coming from high-level evidence-based guidelines. So to me, it seems to be included in this point, whatever its number is, implementation of guidelines or treatment according okay. to guidelines. Okay. Sorry. Um, in, at least from the one derived from the Spanish pile of project, all of them are derived from guidelines. So you can have just one indicator, which is treatment according to guidelines, and then you specify all of them. Um, I have a general question now to everybody here. We are a quarter of an hour over time. We are now approaching very specific diseases. I'm not sure, but maybe there is a chance of including the indicators from the diseases in the guidelines. It's, it's just a thought, because if we go through all the diseases now and try to define indicators for each and every disease, we might well end up later as a luggage <laughs> coming back from the airport. So it has some advantage, I agree. But I don't know, if you want to go through the diseases as well, there are pros and cons as always. I mean, I, I agree that um, there's a number of diseases there with outcome indicators. What I'd be worried about is that we're missing other pain conditions out, which would upset people who've got those conditions and, and patient groups that actually are responsible for those type of conditions. So, you know, we haven't got facial pain there, for instance. And, um, and I think by specifying certain conditions, we either make sure we have all of them there or we have none of them there. And, and I agree, I think they're, they're absorbed into the guideline comment. So would you propose to go through them quickly and, and look whether everything is of, of general interest or what's your proposal? I, I don't think we can go through all of them because I think we, we, there are ones that are missing. Um, um, you know, we've got rheumatoid arthritis, we've got fibromyalgia, but there's lots of other arthropathy, arth arthritis conditions that we haven't got there. We haven't got facial pain. So I propose that these things could actually be captured in the, the guideline comment in the structure um, and just maybe a caption to say that all... Uh, recognised pain conditions have appropriate guidelines as part of the national framework. Or, but but I, I don't see the point of going through the ones that we've got here in the absence of the fact that we are missing some as well. Okay. Can so I just say, we, we could have some sort of... Um, we have to finish, don't we? But um, some sort of prioritisation of some... We, um, in the British Pain Society, we prioritise... Um, four key conditions, which were um, fibromyalgia, um, headache, um, not headache, back pain, neuropathic pain, and pelvic pain, because there were ones where there weren't clear um, guidelines elsewhere. Um, either you know we, we do as Anne suggests and say um, there need to be specific national guidelines, or we just have a, a core set that we agree some key indicators on where, where we know there's some problems. Um, Whatever way, we, we probably need a process of feeding back, don't we, to the group um, where our priorities lie. Okay. So, uh, any further comments to these uh, specific diseases now? Mm. Maybe you could go over the list after the coffee break and see to the completeness, so whether we want to either add more specific terms or come up with more generic terms, so, but make sure that, in a way, nothing is left out. Okay, one more comment. Yes, um, we are here on a SIP meeting, and the societal impact has not been included in any of the indicators so far. What do you think about the return to work indicator or the early retirement indicator? This will be an outcome parameter, right? Yes. Okay, so we I agree. Yeah, I mean, but it's it's a parameter which is maybe not valid for all kind of chronic pain. I'm not sure. 
What about in what about uh, in your in your studies? Did it come out as? No, we we have focus on process indicators. Okay, not an outcome. So um, it should be, or if it okay to be included in outcome. Indicators. So we add them for the outcome. In our Bern the Wellness study, all indications outcome, have work. really high work loss burden and caregiver burden too. I think it's a good point. Yeah. We we just add it now under. Um, unter Anführungszeichen. Just as a, as a title, okay, working loss. title, yeah. return to work, yeah. and we can yeah. define the exact wording maybe later. Return to work, just as a working title. And the second one was, what was the second? Uh, early retirement. Early retirement, thank you. Okay. Just one. Oh. I think the impact group uh, defines return to work as a part of physical functioning, I think. I think it's a w important, but uh, I think they define it as a part of physical function. Okay, we can add this, maybe oh. related to I4 and maybe related to I7. Yeah. No, I think that not is the same, because you can have a disability and go to work or not. Eh? It's not the same. I think that we need to, together. I have a general question. So in Germany, we have some programs that in, in, uh, intend to monitor quality, quality monitoring programs. And I'm wondering where they would be put. So the existence of for example, hospital uh, care monitoring programs that include pain as an outcome parameter. Uh, this is being done, and it's being published, and we, th we think about it. I wonder where this would go. To me, I think for the national health system perspective, I think it would be a process indicator, because you can guide a process of uh, better acute pain care or whatever, and we have no idea what uh, influence on the outcome is, so to that to me means it would be a process indicator. So existence of quality monitoring programs for pain treatment or pain management. That's what Janine and I strategy. Yeah. This would be a processor structure, process indicator. Suggestion is the indicator of uh, quality monitoring. Yeah, existence of quality yeah. monitoring programs. Programs in yes. terms of pain. For pain management. For pain management. It is very complicated. Indicators always are. We have a signature list which is going through. You don't sign anything. You don't sign that you are uh, to agree with only one indicator. You, but you sign that you've been here and you've been part of this process. And I want to thank all of you. And before I hand over to uh, Mrs. Garcia, there is one question I've been um, um, asked to ask you, which I do with great pleasure. Considering all the discussions we have, considering this document, which will now be forwarded on one hand to experts, further on the wording, getting more data in the background, re refining one of uh, some of the indicators, but looking at the process and looking at the list we have now, I would be interested who of you says it was a totally meaningless, awful meeting at all. Okay, no. Uh, my question is, who of you thinks it was worth to discussing it? And, and this document we have now is a good starting point to go on from here. It's no final document, this was clear. Who of you thinks, okay, the discussion was fine, the process were fine, and we have to take this list further for the pain treatment of our patients? Who agrees to that? Okay, and who says, no, it's missing too much? Okay, and who says, I don't know? Well, I don't care. <laughs> okay, so from my, from my side, thank you very much for the discussion. Um, as I told you, number one, our, our request to you is, whenever you have further comments, further remarks, have not been heard, you got new ideas, you found something new, please forward this to the group. Send an email, send a letter, send, a, I don't know, a doll bringing the message, I don't care. Send your remarks. The second will be that this list, this document, goes through an expert panel redefining, uh, looking at some of the issues, and you will be informed about the outcome and how the process is uh, uh, taken from here. 
if you want the document as it is, I think you, it will be distributed anyway. So you can take it on a national basis and go forward as well. It's not a centralized process only. If you want to have it for your own purpose, for your own country, for your own area, please take it as it is. It has been worked out here. Thank you very much.